It's actually, okay, so I'm going to repeat some of what I just said so it's actually captured in the screencast. I downloaded the sample data, uh, which is called project2.zip. I unzipped it and I dragged the grass location into my class GIS database, my grass GIS database. And it's this one here called Wadi Hasa WGS84 UTMZ32N. All right. Do we remember why I named my grass location this funny code name? Anyone remember why I chose, why I might have chosen all of these funny things to go at the end? It's the projection system. Can you tell me, looking at this code name, what the projection system might actually be? Can you guess? Yeah, what does UTM stand for? Somebody shout it. That's right. So what is the benefit of a universal transverse Mercator projection versus a latitude longitude projection system? For distance, it preserves accurate distance. It's exactly right, OK? So if I've decided to give you this data in a UTM projection versus a latitude longitude projection, what does that suggest I want you to do with this data? <laughs> Measure it. I want to do some analysis, OK? So I've saved you the step of reprojecting, right? I did that all for you. Inside is going to be an SRTM that I, or several SRTM tiles I downloaded, patched together, and reprojected. I reprojected everything into this UTM zone because the point of project two and uh, the things I'm going to show today in today's practicum are, are mathematical analyses, right? Some of them will not work in a latitude longitude projection system because of the way that that thing is set up as angles instead of linear distances, okay? All right, so if we're all following along at some point, whether or not you've downloaded this or not, we're gonna start grass as usual, whatever way you want. And because I put this in the right place where it says class GIS database, it shows up in my list of grass locations. And within it shows up a single map set called permanent, all right? Now, permanent is the place where you keep your base data files. It is not the place that you go in to experiment making maps that you want to delete later because you may accidentally delete some important base data and that's going to be a real pain. And some of you have felt that pain in class in project one, okay? So permanent has data in it right now. We're not going to go into permanent. Instead, we're going to make a new map set. You could call this anything you want. I'm just going to call it project two. So I know that all of the things I'm going to make for project two are going to be in this particular map set. I'll just click OK. And I'll start grass, making sure project two is selected there. And I'll start grass session. Right? So it takes a couple of seconds for grass to pop in. We have our familiar grass interface, our layer manager, and our map display. Okay. So as I said before, all, there's three GIS files for you already. They are in the permanent map set, but by default, you have access to per anything in permanent from whatever map set that you're in. So you can go ahead and load those up. Uh, the first one will be the raster map of the elevation, SRTM. So find the little button that looks like a checkerboard with a plus. It says add raster map. It brings up the d.rast module here. And from there, you can drop down here and select. There's only one raster at this point. And you see it says map set permanent, even though we're in map set project two. OK, so we can select. This is called Hasa 30 meter SRTM. Again, I named it this way so that I know what it is and a little bit about it. In this case, the resolution of 30 meters square. All right. So just by clicking OK, it loads in the background. This is the default color scheme for grass 7.2 for any kind of S, uh, DEM that you load in for the most part. We'll talk about color schemes a little bit more later on, but it shows up here. All right. The other two are vector files. They are real archaeological data collected over many years of survey, originally back in the paper and pencil map days, and then eventually with GPS. And I did a lot of work to uh, actually correct some of the errors in them. So this is actually a really good, fairly a accurate, spatially anyway, massive database of sites. All right, There are two surveys that were done. 
One of them is the, the first one is the Wadi Hassa survey. It was done in the early 90s by Burton McDonald of uh, uh, Francis Xavier University in, in, uh, in Canada. And I always get confused because I think of the X-Men, you know, when I say that, <laughs> right? And then the second one is the Wadi Hassa North Bank survey done by Jeff Clark of Arizona State University. And both of these two things are in the same area. So if we load the first one, we'll see a bunch of sites. All of these are archaeological sites, right? And we can load the second one. Same way, finding little V up there and WHNBS. And then you see it added a, a second amount of sites, right? Now, they look like they're all in the same symbol. If you wanted to, you could change the symbol, symbology of the one of them. I picked WHNBS and I go down to symbols over here. The easiest thing to do is just to change them. I'm just going to change them to pluses. So the WHS sites are going to be in. Uh, X's and then the, uh, the WH MBS are going to be in plus. So if I was to zoom in over here, you could actually kind of see the X's and the pluses, right? And basically, each one of these things has a little bit of information about them. Um, if you select one, let's pick a WH MBS sites as our layer, and we click on the little table show attribute. Let me bring that up. So you can see that the table actually has some information in there. The first column is called cat. It is a unique identifier number that GRASS uh, uh, basically generates for each individual point. And it's sequential and it doesn't repeat. All right. So this is a little different than in QGIS where it didn't really do that automatically. GRASS has to have cat. For any vector file, GRASS has to have one column at least that says cat if you're going to have a table. All right. The next one is the site num. Literally, it's the number from the site database. As you can see, it sort of goes along with the cat, but eventually there's some that skip. There are a few sites that fell out of the database that are missing, so that's just the way it is. With any large database, 531 sites, right? A few of them are missing. You have max L and max W. These are the maximum length and width as the survey team recorded out in the field just on their, on their survey. So those are useful bits of information. For example, if you wanted to make a buffer to show the actual size of the sites, which we could do. You could definitely base it on one of those columns. Then we have LND code and site underscore type. All right, And these have other codes over here. This is what those two .csv files are going to help you decipher. It's just the way they coded the database. They used a code. So instead of writing lithic scatter, they wrote LTH underscore SCAT. Right? So in order to do an SQL query later to say pick out all the lithic scatters, you need to know that the code that you're going to query for is LTH underscore SCAT. All right? There are terraces, there are camps, cemeteries, right? They all have their kind of little code. You just got to look up the deciphering of that code in the, uh, in the little CSV. And the same thing over here, terrace, ridge, plateau. This is what they recorded when they were out in the field based on their actual visual assessment of the land form that exists in this area. Okay, So both of the two uh, files, the WHMBS and the WHS, have exactly the same types of information in their tables. The tables are identical. Okay, um, Basically, that's what you need to know at the moment about those two files. So I'm going to hit close on this. And I'm going to go back over here and use my zoom tools to zoom to the default region. I'm just going to zoom back out. You're lucky I already set up a default region to be exactly the size of the SRTM. All right? It's going to be 30 meter resolution. Right? All of that stuff is set. Very importantly, in grass, if you lose track of the region settings, you're going to do a bunch of stuff and then it's not going to turn out exactly the way you thought it was going to be. All right. One of the things I could do if, for example, I'm only interested in this part of the map, I could zoom into this and I could use my tool up here that says set computational region extent from the display. Right? And if I click that and I do anything, the only area of the original map that it's going to do anything to is the area that you see right now. So even if I zoom back out, right? I I zoom back out to this, and I, I'll just do this real quick. I'll tell you what I'll, I'm doing here in a second. 
I'm just going to run a very quick analysis, a train analysis, to do slope. I will, like I said, explain this mo in more depth. But I'm going to pick that, and I'm just going to run this real fast. And you'll see it'll do it really quickly. But it'll only have made the map in the area that I set the computational region to. right? So that's useful. If you don't want to do a calculation on the entire map, let's say instead of just Wadi Hassa, you had all of Jordan, right, or the entire Middle East or something like that. And you didn't want to make a slope map of the entire Near East because you have a small computer, right, and you didn't have a lot of time to wait around. You zoom into an area that you're interested in, set the computational dis uh, extent or region to match the display, and then you run it. It's only going to do work in that area, okay? It's only going to do work in that area. In this case, this is bad for us. We made a mistake. We want to correct it. There are a variety of ways we can do it. We could zoom back out, right? Right here, we could just say zoom to that selected map and then use our same tool to set our computational region to the display, right? We could also right click on this and say set computational region from this particular map. And it would set the region to match exactly that map's boundaries and its resolution. Or we could go manually into settings, region, set region, and we can pick the existing uh, map, match this raster map. And I could pick my 30 meter SRTM and hit run. If I was extremely uh, careful about recording the boundaries of stuff, I could literally enter the <laughs> boundaries in by hand, right? The northing, the easting, the southern, and the west, right? But I can also set the resolution by hand to 30 meters if I wanted to in G dot region, right? Obviously, the easiest thing is to set it to match that map, okay? So I reset the region now to match the entire map. I can rerun my little routine here. I'm just going to check this thing to overwrite the slope map that I already made. If I hit run, it takes a little bit longer, but now I made the slope map for the whole area. Okay, So that's just a quick primer on regions and grass. Very important that you make sure you set the region or check the region at least explicitly before you do any analyses because this is a source of a lot of frustration. Either you're zoomed into a tiny area, or you're zoomed way out, and it's still going to try and make a slope map for the entire Middle East because you zoomed too far out, right? So you just need to make sure you set it to exactly the area you want to work with and nothing else, OK? All right, so what the hell did I just do in making this psychedelic colored map that we're looking at right now, OK? I'm going to repeat. <laughs> This is uh, a fairly basic initial set of analyses that you would want to do with any digital elevation map, DEM, as we talked about on Tuesday. Okay? All of these tools are found in the raster file menu, and in particular, the submenu called terrain analysis, which is the topic for today. All right? So there are really two submenus that we're going to talk about for terrain analysis. The one that's actually labeled terrain analysis and the other one called hydrologic modeling. It's a sort of specialized subtopic of terrain analysis. The very first one that we'll want to work with is this one called r.slope.aspect. Okay? And I will refer to these tools by their little code name. The code name is useful because I could literally type, type it into here. And by hitting enter, it'll pop up, right? So if I know the code name for any module, I can launch it from the command line. I can also uh, launch it from the list of modules over here. I can find it, you know, et cetera. There are a variety of reasons why they have these code names. It's the legacy of GRASS being a, a command line style program, OK? So I have our slope aspect over here. By default, it just needs you to put in a raster file. It really could be any kind of raster file, but this is particularly meant to work with digital elevation maps, okay, models. So a DEM really is what we're talking about. Very briefly, there's a variety of outputs that you can make. The two most useful ones are slope and aspect, like we talked about on Tuesday. We can call them any names that we want. 
I'm just going to call them slope and aspect. I could get more descriptive. I could say of Wadi Hassa. But we are in a location that's called Hassa, right? And we have a map set called Project 2. So by kind of setting up my project properly, I've already got the name sort of set. So I'm not going to forget that this is slope and aspect of Wadi Hassa, right? Because I've organized my project properly. There are a few other things we could do here, curvatures of the landscape. These are sort of more advanced that we're not going to deal with in project two. So I'm just going to leave it as slope and as aspect for now, OK? Um, there are some settings that you can change, mo mostly relating to slope, OK? Has anybody been on like a highway going through the mountains and it says 10% grade ahead? You know, use your, you know, check your brakes before you go down, all right? There's two ways of talking about slope. One is a percentage grade, and the other are degrees, right? Degrees are just the way you think of them, 0 to 360, or in the case of topographic slope, it's 0 to 90 because you can't have landscape that's actually steeper than 90 degrees, right? Um, typically, in GIS, we would want to work with degrees that just sort of make more sense mathematically. Sometimes you need to make a map of percent grade, per perhaps if you're working for the Department of Highways, you know, <laughs> and you need to put a road down, and that's how they measure things. So you could choose percent over here if you wanted to. And really, 100%, I have to actually look it up because I'm not familiar with it. I think 100% is equal to 90 degrees, okay? Don't quote me on that, but I think that's how it works, all right? Um, the other thing here is the type of output for aspect and slope, map, slope maps. You'll see cell, F cell, and D cell. These are the three types of data precision in grass. Uh, cell is an integer, right? No decimal points whatsoever. One, two, three, four, five, six to infinity. An F cell has a small number of decimal points. I think it's four or five, right? And then a D cell has like 16 decimal points after it. So depending on what you're doing, you may want to increase the accuracy. Now, this comes with a trade-off, right? The larger number of decimal points you have, the larger the file. The larger the, they call it the bit depth of the file. So cell data are 8-bit for the most part. These F cell are 16-bit, and then these are 32-bit. And we kind of have that in mind when we think of our Nintendos you know, over the years, when we went from 8-bit video games and they came out with 32-bit, and then there was like 64-bit Sega Genesis. That was the most amazing thing in the world. You guys don't even know what I'm talking about. <laughs> well, yeah, 32-bit, right? And then finally they came out with 64-bit real graphics with Xbox or whatever it was, and that was, that was the most amazing, right? You see, you, get, you know this more than I do. You see, I'm not much of a gamer. <laughs> anyway, but this helps you to remember what we're talking about in the, in the data itself, right? Generally, F cell is pretty good for slope, right, for the most part. We'll leave it at there. Now, if you had a map, you knew it was in feet, and you needed to change it to meters or something like that, you could enter a conversion factor. Almost everything, everything in Project 2 and almost every other piece of data you're going to add in GIS is going to be in meters, all right? So, but just in case you need to, that's here, right? Generally here, we're good. I've selected this overwrite because I already made the slope map, so I'm just going to overwrite the one I made before. I'll hit Run. It's going to chug through it pretty quickly, and it will make the two maps, OK? So here we are. This is the slope map that we've seen before. The other map over here, I'm just going to bring this down, is aspect, right? And it looks like that, all right? Remember we talked about what aspect was. It is the cardinal direction that is being faced by the direction of slope, right? So if I calculate a slope of 45 degrees, right? The aspect is the actual compass direction that I'm facing when I'm standing on that steep slope. Does that make sense? OK. So there's a couple of things we can do here in, in order to sort of manipulate the way we're looking at these things. The first is changing the colors, OK? Now, the color scheme that we're looking at here, as I told you before, is related to the actual numbers that are in the grid of the raster. It's like a spreadsheet. And each number in the grid has been assigned a specific color. Most routines will produce maps. They'll come out with a color scheme that's been pre-assigned to best show 
the data. This particular color scheme is actually called slope in the color schemes that are, come with grass. because It's designed to show slope. So if I bring out my uh, raster legend, I just click OK, and it shows up over here. I'm going to drag it to the right-hand side so you can see. This is essentially the color scheme. Steep slopes are going to be shown in reddish colors. Medium slopes are going to be shown in bluish colors. And low slopes are going to be shown in yellowish to white colors. Okay? This large patch of zero over here is because this is the Dead Sea, perfectly flat surface of the water. All right? Now, this is a very useful default color scheme, but maybe we want to change it, or maybe we just don't want to show all of it at once, all right? So there's a variety of things that we can do to manipulate this color scheme that we're looking at over here. The easiest thing to do is to right-click on the layer that you want to change the color scheme, and then go down to where it says Set Color, color Table, all right? This brings up a module that's called R Colors, R dot Colors. All right. We have, by default, the name of the raster map that we want to change, but we could select any raster map we wanted from the pull down. So that's the first one. And then define, we have the name of the color table. We have a whole bunch of color tables that we could choose from. We could just pick one that says blues, for example. We hit run, and now it's changed the colors in the background. As we can see, this is maybe not as useful to display the full range of slope. And the reason why it's not as useful is because we tend to have many more cells of low slope than we have cells of high slope in most landscapes, right? So in this case, it's showing a lot of white, right, for the map. So it's not a great color scheme the way it is. There are ways that we can make it better, however, all right? And so if we go back to our colors, we have a couple of little check boxes up here, all right? The first one we can click is histogram equalization. Now, I'm going to show you what it looks like, and then I'm going to describe what it's actually doing uh, in a minute here. So I'm just going to hit Run, same blues, but with histogram equalization. And we will see all of a sudden that we got a lot more blue in the picture, and the color scheme changed. All right. So what this is doing, remember the sort of histograms I was showing earlier of the common values? In fact, I can show you it right now. I can actually show you the histogram, which will make some sense. Create histogram of raster map. There you go, right? As we can see, this is sort of skewed to the left, meaning there are many, many, many more values between 0 and 10 than there are between 10 and the, the maximum, which is 90, OK? By default, a linear color scheme will break everything up, let's say, into bins of 10 and apply the colors in those bins. So it'll have 0 to 10 will be white, 10 to 20 will be slightly off-white, 20 to 30 will be a little bit more blue, et cetera, et cetera. But it will be linear, right? The problem is that the data are not linear. They are bunched to one side. If we pick something called histogram equalization, what that does is say, well, instead of going all the way out to 90, we're going to stop at 50 in this case. So we're going to take our same number of bins, but we're going to squish them, right? They're going to be smaller. So instead of being 10, they're going to be 5, right, every 5, right? What that means is that we're going to get more color showing up, right? But it's still linear in the sense that you can see the color spread here goes from fading from uh, 0 to, in this case, 72, the maximum, all right? So that's fairly useful, but it still kind of looks a little crazy in this sense because, like I showed you before, the data are actually not linear. If we had the data sort of condensed but still a nice bell curve, this would actually work a lot better. In our case, the data are bunched to the left side of the plot. So really what we want to do is not do the histogram equalization, but do a logarithmic absolute scaling. All right? And a logarithmic basically will go starting with 10, and then 100, and then 1,000, and then 10,000, and then 100,000. So it'll go in these sort of bigger and bigger and bigger steps. So it, by default, We'll take data that's squished to one side and stretch it out so that it looks linear, all right? And when I select that and hit Run, I'm just going to chug through, we'll actually have a much more nuanced picture of the blues to the left of the, uh, the plot, right? And the, there'll be less whites, right? So we've stretched it in the same way, but we did it with a slightly different logic because it matched the way our, our data actually looked in the histogram, okay, which is here. So a little bit of uh, 
difficult to understand mathematical concept, but it makes sense when you play around with the buttons, right? And you look at your histogram and you say, okay, <coughs> if my data shows up as a big spike on the left, maybe I want to do logarithmic uh, scaling. If it shows up like this, you know, like a big bump in the middle, then histograms equalization might be the thing. If it's generally spread, then you won't have to do any kind of stretching <coughs> on that, all right? So that's really cool. I think blue is probably not the greatest color scheme for that, so I'm actually going to set it back to slope, which you can find down here in the bottom. Slope, hit run, and we'll change it back, right? So you can go back to that. Now, this is a custom color scheme, meaning somebody literally figured out the right breaks to basically custom map the colors for maximum visual impact, all right? But maybe we don't want to see all of those colors. Maybe we want to see a few colors, right? We can do that in a variety of ways. The easiest way is to open up the properties of your uh, raster map, go to selection, and then just give it a range of values to actually show. So maybe I'm only interested in low slope values below 10 degrees. Below 10 degrees slope is really flat. It's basically a good rule of thumb for if you want to put a farm plot or something like that less than that. If I hit apply and I actually sort of got rid of what is in the background you would actually see now I'm literally only showing the green and the yellow areas and everything else appears in white but that's the background. It's actually transparent at this point. All right? So anything I have below it would actually shine through. So if I have in this case the SRTM below it. Right? Now that's okay. Maybe I wanted 0 to 5. I can just change the range over there and hit apply and it changes what's displaying. Maybe I want to show 0 to 5 and then anything greater than 30 degrees I also want to show but I don't want to show anything in the middle. I can hit a comma. I can put 30 to let's say 90 and I can hit apply and now it shows me right 30 to 90 is from here up and 5 down is like from here down in the color scheme and I'm just showing those things. Right. This is for display only. I have not altered the actual color table, not altered the actual raster file. If I want to go back, it's very simple. I just delete my selection and hit apply. And then we're back to the, all the colors, right? Now, I can customly, I can make a custom color scheme too to display these things differently. And the way I do that, again, right click. Instead of set color table, I click the one right below it, set color table interactively. This brings up a nice little display over here. It's actually got colors and it's got categories. So these are actual values of slope and these are the colors, right? Essentially, you can think of these things as little uh, checkpoints. So everything that's 50 will exactly be red. Everything that's 30 will be exactly magenta. Anything between 30 and 50 will be a shade between magenta and red. It's going to sort of fade between them. Uh, linearly, right? So we have basically a series of checkpoints, and between each one, it's going to fade with a series of colors to make your continuous color ramp that you see over here in the uh, in the in the legend. All right. So I can change the values in here. I can change the colors in here. I can add more categories down here. In this case, what I want to do is very simply just uncheck some of these things so that we basically are going to fade from yellow to magenta and not have any blues or greens at all. I can preview what that looks like over here before I hit apply to my actual map. In that case, it changes it, right? Changes the entire color scheme. I have no more blues, I have no more greens. It goes from uh, 2 degrees in yellow and then it fades to 30 degrees in magenta and then it fades from magenta to red 50 and then it fades from red to black. We have no black cells because there's no 90 degree slopes in this particular map, right? So now we can see what we did. If we wanted to change that again, we could get rid of the yellow and just start from zero at white. We can get a quick preview of what that would look like before we apply it. And now we just have fading from white to basically a red color scheme, right? And if I don't like that, I can bring all these back and apply again and, right, it brings them back. But this will alter the color table Every time you load the map now, 
it's going to have this color table permanently until you change it again, all right, with R colors or this manual R colors, all right? Now, this is particularly useful if you want to set up some custom colors. You fool around with this until it looks good because you want to highlight really steep areas or something like that. Maybe I don't want to see the mid slopes. I just want to look like this, what I had before. Click OK. This is great because basically I can say, ah, oh, anything that's yellow is low slope, and then anything that's magenta is like, that's something, a hazard zone or something, right? I'll leave it that way. So I'm just going to leave this in this color scheme for now. If I was to be making a map and I wanted to actually uh, highlight steep slopes, this might be the map that I would use, all right? I could change the colors to highlight any zone of slope that I wanted to. Okay. Questions about that at the moment? There are a variety of ways of collecting the DEM data. Uh, the most basic way would be you to go out there with a survey instrument, either a high precision GPS unit or a total station, and literally just collect XYZ data. Uh, you can only really do that for a small part of the landscape. The other ways of collecting it are from uh, stereo imagery, right, from air photos. And that can be either manually digitized from contours and then translated into a DEM or uh, these days automatically extracted. There are a variety of techniques to automatically extract um, elevation data from overlapping imagery. Probably the best way is with uh, some sort of active remote sensing device like a radar topography imager or a laser topography imager. And the data that we're working with now, the SRTM, are from radar uh, imaging. Those are the most accurate techniques that we have today. Now we have drones, and, uh, and Jolly's going to do this, maybe, <laughs> out in her Alcatio Wells project. Flying a drone with uh, overlapping stereo imagery, we can extract pretty high, pretty accurate, high resolution topography for smallish areas, you know, a couple of square miles or something like that. So there are a variety of ways of getting them. The SRTMs we downloaded, for the, they're available for the whole world. They're probably the best full coverage, pretty high resolution, pretty accurate. Um, elevation data you're going to find from for most parts of the world. And once you get elevation data of any kind, you can do all of these things, okay? I do uh, have a question, but yeah. it's more with ASVAC. Mm -hmm. So um, the way that map or that layer looks, is the shade of, re we said it was like in an angle of light and mm -hmm. lighting. The dark side is the non-face of the I'll show you real quick. I'll just actually do an aspect. I'll change the scale to aspect. And actually, I'm going to have there be a background. OK, so now you can actually read the numbers. So 0 to 360 degrees. In grass, 0 degrees is actually looking directly east, all right? And so basically, you measure from east around the clock, right, like that. So 360 and 0 are the same, both of them looking east. And in this case, they're the black color. Uh, 180 degrees is looking west, and that's the white color. Right? So it sort of fades as you go around the, the, the clock. So how does that reflect the slope or, or um, the, the face of the plane? Of right. The slope? So this doesn't care how steep the slope is. If it's a slope greater than 0, it's going to be sloping in some direction. And that's all it cares about. What direction is it sloping? Whether it's 1 degree or 45 degrees or 90 degrees, it doesn't care. It's just going to pick out which direction the slope is going, right? If you're rolling downhill, which direction are you rolling towards? And we can actually change the colors here, too. I'll just show you real quick. Um, so I set the color table. There is a variety of things that we can pick <coughs> from here. Uh, by default, it comes with the black and white aspect color table. Uh, but you could pick any kind of diverging color table like this one for reds and blues and it'll show up like that. Um, I like one actually that says ramps. So if I go down to ramps, where is ramps? So it's sort of segmented like this and it gives us a really cool kind of three color image, right? So it kind of cuts up the compass into three zones fading from black to that color in each zone. So it's kind of a cool looking, if you really just wanted to do that real quick, zero to 90, right, that kind of stuff. Um, by default, probably the 
the default aspect color tables, what you would typically use. It tends to be normal. You know, people expect it to be looking that way. Okay, so we're going to use the concept of aspect now to do something else, something very uh, useful. Yeah. Can you actually change the direction? So you said grass yeah. from east to west. You can change. It. You can change the direction, when we, and we'll talk about that when we get to the map calculator in a several weeks' time, because oh, okay. you actually have to write a little formula to do that. But you could certainly change the direction. You just have to write a formula to do it. Yeah. Um, yeah, so we're going to build on the concept of aspect now. All right. So this already looks kind of 3D to you, right, when you're looking at this image. Because it kind of is 3D in some sense. It's pseudo 3D. And since your eyes are kind of picking up the change in aspect of the slope of the direction, which relates to actually the topography in some way. All right. So what would be really cool is if we could improve on the way this looks a little bit by bringing light to play into an actual angle of the sun. So it looks as if you're looking down from an airplane, right? So now that we know we can figure out which direction each sloping face of the landscape is actually facing, if we put the sun somewhere, like down here, shining that way, we should be able to figure out what the shade, the shadows would look like at you know late afternoon or something like that, all right? And that is exactly the uh, logic behind the next bit of terrain analysis, which is called um, shaded relief. Pick the one, it's called r.relief, compute shaded relief, all right, from the terrain analysis <coughs> submenu of the raster menu. OK, so here we are. We have uh, same kind of module interface. We need to pick the SRTM, though, the base digital elevation file. And I'm going to call this. Uh, 30 meter hillshade. I could have just called it hillshade, right? On the second tab, we have sun position. It gives you a really good default. You could change this if you wanted to accentuate shadows, right? If you wanted to make it uh, sort of more like it's in spring or, or, or winter instead of summer, you can move the sun sort of further to the north or south. Whether it's closer to evening or midday, you can change it here too. Uh, and then you can change the exaggerated relief, which I'll show you here in a second. I'm just going to do this now and hit run. It chugs along and makes a map that looks like this. Okay, so this is a shaded relief map. In this case, it's pretty close to what it would look like if you're flying over this landscape in a plane, a specific time of day, obviously with all the color and everything removed. Sometimes the relief is low. And we want to pretend like it's more, there's more elevation than there actually is. To do that, we can actually multiply everything by some number. So if I hit like 3 here, I can do uh, shaded relief. And I usually put an x3 to let me know that I'm exaggerating the relief by 3 times. I hit run. And as it's going to pop up here in a second, and we see the shadows and everything are, more, are exaggerated because it's as if all the mountains were taller when the sun was shining on them. This is really useful just to look at the topography, right? But what's really cool is that we can drape our other imagery over this, all right? The easiest way to do this, or the sort of simplest way to do this, is to take a map like slope, make sure it's above our hillshade in the layer manager, and then change the opacity. And we've done this multiple times, right? So here we have what that would look like, kind of shining through a little bit, so transparently. There is a better way to actually do this by fusing them graphically into one display. We have a really great tool over here. It's actually, um, it's actually up here. Right next to the standard add raster map, there are add various raster map layers. If we click there, one of them is add shaded relief map layer. It's a very specific tool. Okay? This is called d.shade. So we pick our hillshade times 3. And then we pick any map we want to actually fuse with that with its colors. Okay, I'll pick the same slope map. We hit apply, and we'll actually fuse it so that it looks a little bit nicer. Right? It's looking a little dark. Sometimes the colors are a little dark when it comes through. Luckily, in the optional tab, we can brighten it. Usually, I brighten everything by about 50. And I hit apply, and it just sort of looks nice in the background. In this particular case, maybe it's a little too bright, so I can change it to like. 30. 
There we go, right? So that looks really nice, right? And now that's actually one layer that I can load and unload like that. So this is what it looked like when we just did opacity, right? Kind of faded. It's still a nice image, but kind of faded. This is what it looked like when we used the real overlay uh, with the hill shade. It looks a lot better, right? So you're going to have to do this for project two. You're going to have to overlay slope and a few other things on this particular hill shade that you make, OK? Um, if we wanted to add like a scale bar, we can definitely do that right now. I like to put the <coughs> north arrow on there as well. So there's my scale bar. I'll stick it over here. I've got my legend. And I'll put my slope map back on the legend. So it's showing exactly like that. I can put it over here. Now I actually have a nice cartographic project, like a little, uh, not project, a uh, product that I can export. And I can save it to a file. And I'll save it to my documents over here. I'll be like, slope, hillshade, hasa, enter. And then in my documents, I have that as a graphic file, right? I could put that into my project two write-up, for example, or any other kind of writing project that I want to do. So there it is, okay? Um, any questions about the hill shade? Does it make sense? Kind of a, just a nice way to make a final nice looking product where you're fusing information about the topography with something else that's a color, okay? Now, a couple other things we can do in terrain analysis. The only other one that you actually have to do for project one is to find this thing that says terrain parameters, r.param.scale. You open that up. Again, we're using the DEM as the base, right? That's our, our real base data. The only data we actually gathered, or somebody else gathered for us, is the DEM. We're deriving everything else from the DEM with mathematical procedures for slope, aspect, etc. This particular one can actually do a lot uh, uh, of different things in it. So if we go down to the optional tab over here, we can uh, go down to where it says morphometric parameter in size window to calculate. We get this whole bunch of stuff, including slope and aspect, right? So you may be wondering why did I choose r.slope.aspect? It's just more it's simpler, right? It's easier to do, and it'll figure it out at the native resolution. This particular one has one other thing over here called size of processing window, odd number only. Now, this is a little confusing, all right? And I'm going to have to draw on the board over here, so I apologize that this will not show up on the screencast, but hopefully you'll be able to hear me. We have a pixel, right? And I drew this kind of thing uh, before. We have a pixel, and then we have all the neighboring pixels that go around it, right, in a window. So this pixel right here is related to the other ones in the DEM because it's a continuous surface, right? The surface is changing as we go across it. So last Tuesday, I talked about how we calculate slope. So if this is the highest one and this is the lowest one across our cell, we can go from this to this, right? And we can figure out the rise over the run and the slope. Now this is a three cell by three cell neighborhood, right? From here to here and here to here. Three cells by three cells, not a total of nine cells. This is the default moving window for graphs when it's calculating things like slope. It needs to know the relationship of cells in the neighborhood. It'll start by three by three. You can, in our param scale, increase the neighborhood size. So we could actually go, and it has to be odd because of the way the shape is, right? It has to be odd. We can go out another one on this side, which means we have to go out more on this side, right? And more on this side, like that. And the same thing down here, right? So I'm drawing over this. So this is a five by five cell neighborhood. And we can go out again, seven by seven, nine by nine, 11 by 11, 15 by 15. Now the difference is that it's going to start from the end and go to the, let me do this in a different color so you can see, right? So it's going to start from this end and go all the way across. Green does not want to be my friend, I'll just use the wood. All right? So it's actually going to count one, two, three, four, five cells when calculating the slope instead of one, two, three cells. So the slope that it will calculate is going to be different. 
it's going to be at a larger scale when we do that. So we'll be actually coarsening our data. You may ask, why would I want to do that? Well, there are a variety of reasons why you want to do that. Let's say you have a lot of micro topography in a relatively flat area. And you want to do an analysis of how ancient humans selected sites based on regional flatness. Not local topography, but regional flatness. Right? So maybe the slope from here to here is actually quite high, 20 degrees. But if you make a big neighborhood of 5 by 5 or 7 by 7, maybe it's actually only like 2 degrees across it, because there's just like a little bump. Right? So you want to actually course in your scale for calculating slope. Our param scale lets you do that right here in the size of the processing window. 3, 5, 7, right? You can't use an even number, it'll throw up an error, right? But if you put an odd number there, it will do that at that size scale as it moves across the landscape. Now, the other thing that it can do is using information about slope and aspect and also curvatures, which is how quickly the slope changes over uh, uh, distance, it can automatically extract specific features, slopes, uh, mid-slopes, ridges, flat areas, channels, that kind of stuff. So this is what we'll do here. We'll select feature from the pull-down menu. I'll actually coarsen it up to nine at this particular moment. And then I will put here Hasa features 9x9, 9 by 9, right? I know this is 30 meters, so I could do 9 times 30. I could actually figure out the scale that we're actually working at here, all right? So if I hit run, this may sometimes take a while. The bigger neighborhood you give it, the longer it will take because it has to crunch a lot more numbers. And that makes this crazy looking thing in the background. So let me change this to be our features. Where are we here? Features nine by nine. And I'll have to drag it over here. And it gives us an explanation. This explanation in the legend is massive. So I'm actually going to make it smaller by changing the font to be like eight points. And there we go. So a little smaller. <laughs> I can stick this over here, right? So basically, the colors here relate to specific landscape features, channels, passes, ridges, slopes, etc. And if I zoom in on part of the map, you'll actually see it better, right? <coughs> Anywhere yellow is a ridge top, Anywhere blue is a channel. Anywhere gray is flat. The little bits of red, you can barely see one right here, are peaks. Now, 9 by 9 might not be the right scale that I'm interested in doing this. So I can go back to my R param scale. I can change this window. And I can make it really big. I'll make it 15, all right? Again, I want to change the name of the file that comes out 15 by 15. Right? I'm, I'm documenting very briefly what I'm doing just in the name, like I always say we should do. We hit run. It's going to chug through. Again, it takes a little bit longer because it's a much bigger neighborhood that it's sort of looking at. And then all of a sudden we see like it actually shows up at a different scale. So it's ignoring small ridges and small channels and only looking at the larger patterns of the landscape. Right? So your task will be to figure out the proper scale to show you these kind of things. And then you can go back to your hillshade. And you can overlay the um, features over that, right? And you can make a nice hill shaded map with all of those features we'll lay it over the top. OK. Now, one of the other things that we can do, if all we have loaded in is uh, an elevation file, let me just change the opacity back to this. Hold on. Where are we? Here we go. If, if we have an elevation file, right, and then some other color file, so making sure all the other ones are deselected at this point, all your hill shades and that kind of stuff, we can shift from the 2D to the 3D view, and it will try and drape the colors over them, right? <laughs> Actually, sorry, I made a mistake. Let me just go back to the 2D view. You only have to, you can only have the elevation file selected, all right? Everything else should be deselected, but uh, in the menu there. Now you can switch to the 3D view, and it will show up over here. Of 
course, it's going to have this crazy uh, vertical exaggeration, which is, I'm going to set it real quick. Where is it? Actually, what I'm going to do just to make it easier on everybody is to go back here. I'm going to get rid of all of the layers real quick and add them again. OK, so now it's not going to get confused. In fact, what I'm going to do is refresh everything. I'm going to add my SRTM back in here. Ah. Somehow it's got screwed up with this stuff. Hold on, 3D view, data, shininess, position Z. Ah, uh, oh, there it is. Okay, I'm gonna set that back to one. There we go. Okay, vertical exaggeration exaggeration was set to 100 in that case, which which made it look really weird. Right, so now I'm actually looking in perspective view in 3D view, right? I can zoom in and out. I can add and subtract things. I can change the source of the light. I can change my actual perspective on the thing here. So I can make this be a really cool, like I'm actually in a plane, really looking at it in 3D, okay? And I can overlay. Um, other maps over here. So if I have this thing that says color, I can actually pick the color of the slope map. And then what I want to do is over here where it says fine mode resolution, I want to just <coughs> click that down to one. Now when I'm looking at this, I'm actually seeing the color of the slope map extruded over the uh, SRTM. And I'm at a really weird angle. So if I kind of zoom out over here, way out, and I set this to be like, there we go. So now we can see I'm kind of looking at this from high above, like that, looking kind of down on it right there. And I can actually set this vertical exaggeration a little higher so we can actually see the topography a little bit, right? And now as I, I apologize that my windows are kind of overlapping each other. But as I move this thing around, I'm actually moving the perspective that I'm looking from, right? I can zoom in with this tool <coughs> over here. So you'll have to fool around with this yourself to see exactly what everything does. But basically, I'm looking down the canyon now, kind of at a perspective view, right? I can move these sliders. I could change the vertical exaggeration so it looks like the Grand Canyon, you know, that kind of stuff, all right? So this is just another way to kind of fuse the elevation with your with your other data. You can um, overlay vectors on top of this. There's a, a variety of things that you can do, OK? So if I was to do vectors, I would go down here, and I would add them from this dialog. OK. So one last thing to do, and we might run out of time, but I will record it in another screencast. One last thing to do is some hy basic hydrologic uh, analysis. So in this case, we're going to go down to where it says hydrological modeling. We'll find this tool that's called r.watershed, watershed analysis. We click on it. It's going to bring a new module up, hopefully. I'm going to close some of these things that are in the background. There we go. And the same thing, we're going to start with our 30 meter SRTM always. And there are a lot of things we can do with this, but the one that we we'll want to do is on the output tabs, the first one is called accumulation. This is if water fell, if you had a rainstorm and it was all even, this would show how it would flow across the landscape, right? So I'm going to call this flow ACC for flow accumulation. I'm going to hit run. It's actually quite efficient. There we go. We have a map like this. If we zoom in on it right here, and we change our scale to flow ACC, 
we will see lots of crazy numbers over here, but basically the darker the color, the more water is flowing across the landscape. Now, one thing I didn't do, and I forgot to tell you, is that if you go to the optional thing over here, you want to check this box that says use positive flow accumulation even for likely underestimates. Don't worry what this is actually doing. It's, it's trying to be clever by using negative numbers if the water flowed off the screen, but most all of the water flows off the screen, right, because the edge of the map is square. Um, we could also click this beautify flat areas. And if we uh, allow overwriting, which is somewhere in here, we hit run again. It's going to change the scale on that. All right, so now we have like crazy colors. But basically, you can see yellow is very little flow accumulation. And then it goes through green and then to darker blue and darker blue. So the darker colors are the larger streams basically in this map. And one last thing we can do is actually extract a vector file of the streams from this. So we go back to hydrological modeling and we go to r.stream.extract and we uh, can choose, we again choose our SRTM on our input maps over here we choose the flow accumulation map we just made, flow.acc. And then over here we have another thing that says minimum flow accumulation for streams. You can tune this to ignore like small streams, right? So I'm actually going to put like 10,000 right, uh, cells. You have to have 10,000 cells upstream from you to even start to be a stream, all right? And then the output map, I'm going to choose vector map. I'm just going to call it streams. We'll hit run. It'll do its thing really quickly. And then we're going to have a crazy vector file. So if I zoom back out, you'll see. Here's our streams right here. So it's really just showing me the largest streams because I chose like 10,000 as the cutoff. If I chose like 100, it would show me a lot more small streams, all right? And if I want to display it nicely, I can open it up. And actually, I'll show you the table real quick. The table has a little bit of data in it. So it's got the sort of a type code that tells you where the position is it an initial stream or an intermediate stream. So over here, I could choose um, a nice color for the streams. I'll pick this blue color because water is blue. So in the background, that's turned everything, all the streams blue. But I could actually change uh, the thickness of them by choosing the type code column. And I can multiply that by 10, let's say, and hit apply. Oh, that's too much. Multiply it by 2, <laughs> hit apply. And now all the main trunk streams are going to be thicker than the other streams, right? So if I actually just show you what that looks like overlaying on the hillshade map we looked at earlier, it looks like that, all right? That's a really cool kind of um, display. And I could actually show the sites over the top of this by just grabbing some of them as a vector file. This other one. And now we can see how the sites are all clustered up around some of the streams, right? So that's a pretty cool and useful thing to know how to do. You're going to have to extract the stream uh, uh, network for project two, and then we'll do some distance mapping using the stream network next time, right? When we talk about cost surfaces, right? So that's where we're at for today. This screencast will go up today, later. And uh, from now on, I'll re pre record some of the screencasts and we'll just mess around with actually doing it, all of us in class, okay? All right.